السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين سيدنا مولانا محمد عليه وعلى آله أفضل الصلاة وتم التسليم Welcome back to our second episode of our Quran journey I ask Allah سبحانه وتعالى to grant us guidance to grant us clarity to grant us happiness through the Quran اللهم اجعل القرآن العظيم ربيع قلوبنا ونور صدورنا وجلاء أحزاننا وذهاب همومنا وغمومنا اللهم ذكرنا من القرآن ما نسينا وعلمنا من القرآن ما جهلنا وارزقنا تلاوة القرآن آنا الليل وأطراف النهار على الوجه الذي يرضيك عنا As we discussed before, we're going to be journeying through the Quran from the lens of the seerah So integrating the Quran with the seerah together and looking at how the companions themselves interacted with the Quran and how the tabi'een interacted with the Quran So this is again a tafsir that is focused on the chronological development of the uh, seerah and the Quran, inshallah. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this a beneficial endeavor for all of us. Welcome back. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and give you the best in dunya and akhirah. As the usual, we're going to begin, inshallah ta'ala, with the recitation. And after the recitation, inshallah, uh, the sister, Sister Rana, will be hopefully, inshallah, joining us to do the uh, American Sign Language. So let us begin with the recitation. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اقرأ بسم ربك الذي خلق خلق الإنسان من علق اقرأ وربك الأكرم الذي علم بالقلم علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم كلا إن الإنسان لا يطغى أرآه استغنى إن إلى ربك الرجع أرأيت الذي يمها عبدا إذا صلى أرأيت إن كان على الهدى أو أمر بالتقوى أرأيت إن كذب وتولى ألم يعلم بأن الله يرى كلا لئن لم ينته لنسفعا بالناصية ناصية كاذبة خاطئة فليدع نادية سندع الزبانية Surat Al-Alaq. Before we begin with the surah, let's just share a quick reflection. I remember one of the earliest things that, you know, my teachers and my father has mentioned to me. The Quran is like a vast desert. Des de desert, not desert. The Quran is like a vast desert. Some people walk. And they look at this desert and they find that it's empty. They, they don't see anything. It's barren. So some people do that with the Quran. Just ancient fables and tales that is not going to be in any shape or form relevant to the modern society and the modern time. So some people look at it as something that's abandoned and old and barren and useless and impractical. Others will look at the desert and they will look at the surface. They will scratch the surface and they will find, you know, uh, minerals and they will find other important things. Others will dig deeper and they will find rubies and sapphires. Others will dig deeper and they will find um, gold and they will find other ores. Others will dig even deeper and they will find oil and other rich resources. And others will dig deeper and will find diamonds. So the same thing with the Quran. It depends on how well you dig. And how patient you are. And the person who comes in, if you read the tafsir, some mufassirin, some commentators will focus on the linguistic aspect of the Quran because that's where they're trained. So they will come in and they will realize the profundity in the language of the Quran. Others who are trained in politics will come and realize, wow, the Quran is full of gems when it comes to our own political um, ambitions and our own political uh, thinking and thought. Others who come from a sociological training will look at the Quran and say, wow, the Quran is full of uh, gems and pointers and, and things that you can really, really appreciate from a sociological point of view. Same thing from a psychological point of view, from a biological point of view. And you will come to realize that the Quran, there are so many different layers and every one of us will extract from the Quran that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to do so 
depending on, on our own ambitions, our own knowledge, our own training, and of course, most importantly, how much sincerity we have. And so, Wallahi subhanAllah, you, you know, when, when you teach the Quran, you see the barakah, you see the blessing in your own life. You see how it impacts you. It makes you lighter. It makes you happier. It makes you more encouraged. It makes you more excited to give back. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, calls this Quran ruhan min amrina. It's, it's, a, it's got a life of its own. It's a, it's a spirit of its own. It's, it's alive. It interacts with you. With, with your mind, with your heart, with your soul, it interacts with you on multiple, multiple layers. And inshallah, we'll come to appreciate that together, bidnillah ta'ala. All right, so let's let's look at the screen here, inshallah. Hopefully you can see the screen. Just make it bigger. Sayyid. Hopefully, can everybody see the screen? Jazakumullah khair. Perfect. So last time, we talked, we introduced the surah. We introduced the surah a little bit. And today, inshallah, we're going to begin with the second. Uh, we Technically, we, we did the first surah, uh, first ayah. We said, Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. Khalaq al-insana min alaq. Read in the name of your Lord. Who created? Created what? Created everything. Created everything. First, we discussed that the word qira'a and iqra doesn't just mean to read. It means to read, to recite, to spread, to remember, to begin, to share, to speak on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the notes are there for all of us to reflect and to read upon on your own time, inshallah ta'ala. Tamam? And we said iqra bismi rabbika could mean read on behalf of your Lord. Or read with the assistance of your Lord, or read knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will show you every step of the way and guide you every step of the way. And last time, just to add on to the reflections that we we, we shared a little bit last time, you know, if you look at the story of how the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, received revelation, we see the human aspect of Rasulullah. We see that he runs back to his wife. He's confused, he's worried, he's wondering, what's happening to me? What's going on? He's confused. So imagine when you're, when you're reading the story of a fake prophet or a fake uh, messenger who claims that they have received prophethood from Allah or who claims to be speaking on behalf of Allah. You see that the story is, is, is it's, it's very grand. It's very ambitious. It's as if everything fell in place from the very beginning and the guy knew exactly what was happening. But with Rasulullah we see the humanity of Rasulullah We see the human aspect of Rasulullah That he's confused, that he goes to his wife and he tells her, I don't know what's happening to me. And she comforts him and she gives him that support. And she tells him, by Allah, he tells him, by Allah, Allah will never disappoint you. Why? Because you are a person who's good to everybody around you. So we see that the story of Rasulullah from the very beginning is a story of a, of a human being whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses as a messenger and chooses to elevate. But from the very beginning, there's what? There's lack of, there's, 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 there's not really complete, complete awareness of what's going on. That sometimes you could be really, really blessed, but you're not aware of that blessing yet. And it comes with time that you come to really appreciate the blessing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. So if there's a lesson that we take from that. Sometimes we are privileged, we're wrapped and engulfed in blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but we may not be aware of them yet. But things will be clear with time. Things will be clear with time. Excellent. Now, if we begin today, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in the second ayah, insana min alaq. He created the human being, al insana. He Allah خلق al insana created the human being from alaq. From alaq. Recently, there's been a discussion on what this term alaq means. What this term alaq means. Uh, I, I actually received a, a message or a phone call recently from one of uh, one of uh, you know colleagues, and he was wondering, alaq does it really mean a blood clot? Is the Quran supporting the idea that the human being is created from a blood clot? Because that existed in Galenic medicine and other philosophers, Greek classical philosophers wrote about this 
And it was obviously a mistake. You know, they, they assumed that the human being was created from a blood clot. So is it really that the Quran is making the claim or making the argument that the human being is, is created from a blood clot? Far from that. Far from that. And here it may be beneficial. It may be beneficial. Let me just um, sister here. It may be beneficial to mention, listen to this carefully. It may be beneficial to mention that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses words, those words have to make sense to the first primary audience of the Quran. So they have to make sense to the Arabs who are listening to the Quran. And they have to also make sense to every subsequent generation that is to come. So it has to be relevant to the 21st century thinker. And it has to make sense to the Bedouin Arab who is living in the desert, listening to the Quran for the first time. And that's what makes the Quran very unique. If the Quran started to give this elaborate description of how the human comes to be, right? Imagine the Quran were to give a full account from a neuroanatomy and a cellular biology point of view, an evolutionary biology point of view. Well, it would be considered at that time by the audience of the Quran at that time irrelevant. Like, what are you talking about? We don't believe in any of this stuff. We've never seen it. So the human development has not reached a point where it's ready to fully understand the details of creation. So the Quran is going to be very specific in giving enough to encourage that journey and encourage the inquiry. And it will continue to still be relevant. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, خَلَقَ الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ عَلَقَ Let's look at this as a good example of that. So what does the word alaq mean? The word alaq, let's look at the linguistics. So whenever we look at a word of the Quran, we have to go down to the basics. We begin first, first layer with the linguistics. The word alaqa is often interpreted as a clot of blood. But that's not necessarily true. Because alaq, and we'll explain why it came to be associated with that. The word alaq literally means to come and to stick together. So it's something that is sticky. And that's why we call a relationship in Arabic, ilaqa. A relationship is called ilaqa because it's one where you're attached. So it's an attachment. It's a sticky thing. It's something that sticks. And also... It is something that is suspended. It's something that is suspended, like muallaqa, when someone is left hanging or suspended, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses in the Quran to a wife whose relationships are not, or who, whose emotional and other responsibilities are not given to her, what she's owed is not given to her by her husband. So she's called a muallaqa, someone who's left hanging. And it's also associated with the, with the word leech. It's also associated with the word leech because a leech will literally stick onto you and uh, take away uh, or or start consuming the resources that you have. So this is the linguistic meaning. It comes from the thing that means sticky, to, to be sticky, to be suspended, to be attached, to hang, all of these things. So when the Arabs heard this, the earliest mufassirin, if you look at the earliest mufassirin, and maybe if you're paying attention, inshallah ta'ala, we'll do, we'll do a, a really interesting thing together. So I want to actually pull it up, inshallah. Uh, later on, hopefully we'll be able to pull it up. And what I want to do is I want to actually show you, show you that all the different mufassirun, all the different mufassirun, they have written about the topic. Remind me, inshallah ta'ala, towards the end, hopefully to do this. Uh, but if you look at any surah, if you look at any surah, and you go through the mufassirun, you will see that over time, over chronology, over a chronological point of time, different things will become the focus in tafsir maybe linguistic and then over time becomes biological and then the biological becomes less interesting so people switch to you know uh sociological psychological so every tafsir has its orientation but if you look at the earliest tafsir like for example muqatil and we'll talk about the problems with his tafsir later but muqatil he mentions the word alaqa literally means sperm so for the Arabs, you can imagine when they're reading this Allah created the human from alaq. What is alaq? Something sticky. A substance that is trivial, that seems to be trivial. As something that attaches. Um, as some, something that, you know, uh, attaches and then even cleaves, right? Cleaves or breaks off or divides. Those are all associated with the term. So for them, because attaching, cleaving, hanging, all of these things are associated with the word. So they assume that the word literally means sperm. Something sticky, something that comes together or sticks. And then later on, they also said it could refer to the uh, excretion that is released by the female. So the sexual excretions or the sexual cells that are released 
by the males and the females. Now, back then, they didn't understand the, the concept of a cell. That's a very modern concept. So they were talking about it in the sense of secretions, that these are the things that are secreted. So in the minds of the classical scholars, from the very beginning, we see that the scholars, the earliest commentators on the Qur'an, whether they're writing on the Qur'an from a historical point of view or from a tafsir point of view, those commentators are associating the term with something that is sticky, a substance that hangs. Tamam? Now, later on, when the Muslims were reading and coming into contact with Galenic medicine and other forms of medicine that existed at the time, they borrowed the idea that the human being comes from a, cl a, bl a blood clot. So they said, oh, is a blood clot, when the blood coagulates, does it become sticky? Yes, so it could be a blood clot, that's fine. So they're accepting and borrowing from um, Western medicine that was available to them at the time, and they're making sense of what they're reading based on that. It's kind of like when we read the surah, when we read the ayah, um, Do they not see that the earth and the heavens, everything that was existent, was once one entity, and that entity exploded explosively. And from that, everything was created, or from water, everything was created. So when we read that, we're like, wait a second, as, as audience now living in the 21st century, we say, that sounds a lot like the Big Bang. Now, is the Quran saying anything about the Big Bang? It's not. But is, is there room to superimpose the Big Bang as a theory upon the ayah? There is. You could make a case for it. It could be strong, it could not be. The idea here is that the Quranic text is, is, is suggestive. It is not a book of science. It's not there to teach you biology. The idea from the very beginning is to make a point that, ex that, 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 that still holds true from a biological point of view, because the one who created us is the same one who's revealing the Quran. There's not, there's not going to be discrepancy between what Allah reveals to us in the form of text and what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sets in motion in the form of universal laws and biological constants. Does that make sense? So if you look back at the ayah, خَلَقَ الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ عَلَقْ If we're reading it through the history of the Mufassirun, some Mufassirun say the alaq here literally means a relationship. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the human being from a relationship, from an attachment, from a thing that hangs, a substance that sticks, so from sperm, from uh, the egg that the female releases, and all of those meanings hold true. And actually, if you look interestingly, if you look interestingly at the hear me oh you cannot you cannot hear me when i now you can okay perfect jazakumullah khair may allah bless you so whenever i turn uh, my section off you're not able to hear khair inshallah um so if you look if you look again at the way that biology books describe the relationship uh or the fertilization they say fertilization happens in two main phases in the first a sperm recognizes an egg sticks to its jelly-like coating and strips to reveal parts of its cellular membrane in the second phase the cell membranes of the egg and the sperm cling together in an intimate embrace before fusing to allow dna to meet now from my perspective when i'm reading this uh, and when i was studying you know uh, neuroanatomy and and um, and uh, biology uh, and and the way uh, the way the baby is, is is formed subhanallah one word that comes to mind is what or one one thing that keeps popping up is what clinging uh, coming together, sticking together, intimate embrace, fusing. And all of those terms are associated with the word alaq. So the, the Quranic description still holds true. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us a word that still holds true and carries so much profundity, in, profundity and meaning. Tamam? And that's really important to go back to the basics. So this is again a very beautiful and an amazing, incredible uh, reference. But we're not going to make a big um, a big claim by saying, oh, you know, this is this is what the Quran is, is speaking about from the very beginning. This is how the Muslims, earliest Muslims understood it. That's not important. That's not important. If we go back and we're honest in asking how did the earliest Muslims understand it, the earliest Muslims understood it as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making a very simple reference that we are created from a very simple entity. 
a, a, a sticky entity that is small, that is trivial, and that most of us neglect to think about. And that small thing carries enough information, like a small little seed carries enough information to give rise to this big, incredible being that is the human being. So that's the point. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, خلق الإنسان من علق, the biologist can say, wow, that's really interesting. The philosopher can say, wow, that's really interesting. The historian can go back and be like, I want to see how the word alaq evolved in the mind of the reader of the Quran throughout time and space. Really interesting. But at the end of the day, the original audience of the Quran thought, the point here is to remind me that I'm so limited, that I'm so small, that I was once a small little entity, a little sperm, a little egg. That's who I am. So how can I have this arrogance? Because the, the main focus of the surah in the end is arrogance, attacking this egoistic entitled attitude. Amen? So the idea here is that we are reminded of our smallness and the smallness of our origin. The smallness of our origin. So those who say it's a dam in ghalil in jamid, it's a blood clot that is thick and sticky, they're referring to what they understood based on the knowledge that they had at the time. But the earliest, earliest scholars, before the classical uh, works and philosophies were brought into the Muslim world, looked at this as a reference to the, uh, the, the sperm or to the uh, act of clinging or attaching of some kind. Excellent. Does that make sense? I hope that's a good exercise in how we should be critical about the way that we see uh, and read the ayat of the Quran and also critical of what we hear about the ayat of the Quran because people will say, oh, look, your earliest Mufassurun say it's a blood clot. See, you're just reading what's coming from classical uh, Greek and Roman philosophy. But calm down, relax. Let's look at the bigger picture. طيب. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Iqra wa rabbuka al-akram. This is the third ayah. Iqra wa rabbuka al-akram. Karam in the Arabic word is associated with nobility and generosity and honor. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and reminding the audiences of the Quran, read, 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 continue reading and know that your Lord is the most generous. So even Muhammad, if you were to go moments of humiliation, know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most generous. At the end, he's going to honor you. And if you go through the highest moments of honor, know that at the end, Allah is the most honorable. So if you're in the weakest moment in your life, you're, you've fallen, remember that Allah is the most honorable. So by connecting back to Allah, you can regain your honor. And if you're in a position where you're really honored and people respect you and people look at you with all this honor, don't let that deceive you because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most honorable. So if you let the honor that people attribute to you distract you from connecting to the most honorable, you have lost track of what is really, really important. So read, O Muhammad وسلم, and know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most honorable. So what is, what is the connection? Iqra wa rabbuka al-akram. Iqra, read, recite, but know that you're not going to really see the world just based on your own intent to read. Honor is still from Allah. So if you want Allah to honor the way that you read reality, connect with Him. It's like saying, read, 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 and know that at the end, it is Allah who is the most generous. Most generous in the way that he's going to teach you, in the way that he's going to allow you to see, in the way that he's going to empower you. So continue to read, but know that Allah is the one who's going to bless your knowledge and bless your quest for knowledge. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you look at the word karam, karamna bani Adam, and certainly we have honored the children of Adam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Baqarah, وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ وَيُعَلِّمُكُمُ اللَّهِ And have taqwa of Allah, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will teach you. So the idea here is to have humility in the way that you seek knowledge. And one of the most beautiful hadith of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the hadith that is narrated by Umar al Khattab. He says, I heard Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or I heard Umar, he says, تَوَاضَعُوا فَإِنِّي سَمِعْتُ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول مَنْ تَوَاضَعَ لِلَّهِ رَفَعَهُ اللَّهِ Umar is saying, oh people, have humility because I heard Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saying, whoever has humility with Allah, Allah will honor and raise them. So the way that he looks at himself, the way that she looks at herself, I think of myself as small, very small. I haven't done anything. My self-impression, my impression of myself is that I am a small being but in the eyes of people Allah will make you great in the eyes of people 
وَضَعَهُ اللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلْ And whoever puts himself in a position where he's more grand than what he's entitled to, like you're a small little student but you pretend to be a big sheikh or a big scholar, or you're a small little uh, business person but you buy a bigger house and a bigger car than what you can afford basically to give people the impression that you're greater than you really are, Right? To give people, that's what takabur is. To give people the impression that you're greater than you really are. And with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to speak with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a way that like you, you don't really understand your position and your, you, 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 your, your self-image, who you are in your own eyes is way too greater than what it should be. Right? So that's what takabur is. So Allah says, whoever has that, وَضَعَهُ اللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلْ فَهُوَ فِي أَعْيُنِ النَّاسِ صَغِيرٍ وَفِي نَفْسِهِ كَبِيرٍ so in the eyes of people, people see him or her as something very small and trivial and someone that's very disgusting and very useless. But in his own eyes, in her own eyes, wow, I'm so important, I'm so big, do you know what I did? So they always attribute that to themselves. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually mentions in the Quran that among the people that are most disliked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they like to take credit for things that they have not done. So that's not a sign of someone that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will honor and bless. You're working in a project and everybody's contributing and committing together, but you want to take credit. Oh, you know, yeah, the success is because of me. No, a good, humble individual will always attribute the khair to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to the people around. And that's someone that people will really appreciate. Works behind the scenes, supports, uh, prods, encourages. Is not what we're looking for. We don't want to look at ourselves as grand, but in the eyes of people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will humiliate us. Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us, Iqra, read, look, search, uh, grow, uh, empower, الأكرم, because Allah is the one who's going to be most generous. Don't underestimate how much Allah can give you. Don't underestimate how much Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can empower you. Don't ever give up. Life is life is a struggle. Yes, there will be moments of difficulty. Yes, but don't forget the honor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah is the most honorable in the moments of difficulty and in the moments of blessing and honor. He's the most honorable at the end of the day. طيب. الذي علم بالقلم. Read in the name of the one who taught by the pen. Here's another reference that is vague. It is vague. And so there are ways that this could be read. And the scholars will look at this in multiple ways. The first is that this is a reference to the qalam, which is the written script. The written script. Imagine if we did not have a way to communicate our thoughts through writing or inscriptions. How else would we be able to transmit knowledge? Knowledge would end at the end of that generation. So imagine the ancient Egyptians, whatever they learned, imagine they couldn't connect or transmit that knowledge to us. Our ability to progress and develop would have been very limited. So some of the commentators refer to this as al-qalam, meaning the written script. Tamam? For example, uh, for example, Qatada says, Al-Qalamu ni'matin min Allahi Azza wa Jal Azima. Lawla Dalika Lam Yakun Deen, Lam Yakum Deen, Walam Walam Yasluhu Aisha. The written script or the pen, the ability to inscribe, is a big blessing from Allah. Without it, no religion, no religion would have been preserved or would have been established. And without it, no living structure or living being or form of life could have existed, could have been functional. Like there's no function. There's really no um, social structure or, or living structures, constructions would not be possible without the gift of um, the gift of writing, writing. Tamam? Also, so it's writing. Others say it's the preservation of knowledge. Allama bil qalam, it's a reference to the preservation of knowledge. And the Imam al-Shafi'i has his famous quote in which he says, Al-ilmu sayyidun wal kitabatu qayduhu qayyid suyudaka bil jibal al-wathiqa fa min al-hamaqati an tasid ghazalatan wa tatrukha bayna al-khala'iqi taliqa which means knowledge is like hunting, a hunted game. And writing is what keeps it firmly bound. Tie your what you hunt to the secure mountains because it is foolish to catch a deer and then to leave it alone in the wild. You caught the deer. Now you're gonna let it be? No, you don't. So whatever you not whatever you learn, write it down. Write it down. And this is again referring to Allama bil qalam. It is Allah who taught through our ability to read and spread and teach and record. So all of that is associated with the qalam, meaning the human pen, a reference, a metaphor for the ability to read and write and transmit knowledge. The qalam, also some have said, it is the pen of the scholars, the judges, and the kings. 
and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes an oath by this noon wal qalami wa ma yasturun by the pen and that which they scribe in lines through it tamam so al qalam also um actually comes from the original word taqlim which is the process of sharpening wood to make it pointed to be able to read and write so this could be the written contract through which judges have the power to give and to issue verdicts through which scholars have the power to uh, issue verdicts right it's the process of writing and that writing now is given weight and is given some form of power طيب. the fourth opinion is that al-qalam actually means the divine pen because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we know according to the hadith um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, Nabi sallam says uh, or actually it's, it's a reference that's given to Ibn Abbas Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu says inna awwala ma khalaqa Allahu al-qalam faqala lahu uktub the first thing that Allah created is the divine pen and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded it to write so before everything that we know came to be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had already a written a written account of what would happen now this is this is a it's a tough one and the concept of qadr the concept of qadr is very difficult to kind of understand and maybe now is is, is not the time to delve into it deeply but one of the ways that um young young students you know some of my young students when when they ask me how how is it that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what we're gonna do before we do it and how does he have a written account of that before it actually took place and and if, if he has a written account then isn't he aware of what we're gonna do so how can he punish us for something that it, 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 you know it's, it's it's a difficult topic to grasp but the way to understand it imagine imagine allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we well, can't imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course, but imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being in a position where he's not limited or bound by anything that he created. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by necessity, he's the creator. So he's not bound by any of his creation, whether physical or abstract. So time, for example, is, 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 a, is a construct in our mind. Time is a construct in our mind that is limited by or limiting us as human beings. We're limited by time. I can exist now. I may not exist in the future. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not limited by time. He's able to access any moment in time. He is able to. He's not limited in his knowledge and in his scope. We are limited by time and space. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may occupy a, a space in a way that befits his majesty. How we know. Allahu alam how. Tamam. We know he might occupy a position but he's not limited by that occupation and limited by that position so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he's not limited by time or space everything that happened or happens or is happening it's already happened by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's like you know it's like when i'm when i'm editing a video i'm watching i'm putting these clips together and i have a timeline of you know my my, my video I'm able to go back and I'm able to move forward and I'm able to move and shuffle. Why? Because I'm not limited by the timeline. I'm watching the timeline. So I'm I'm outside of the timeline. Does that make sense? So I'm not limited by the timeline. I can go to the past and I can go to the present. But if I'm a small little clip that is stuck in that time, I'm limited by that. I don't have an autonomy of my own. I don't have a will of my own. Tamam? So similarly with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's like another example is when I'm watching a move, when I'm watching a, a soccer game after the game took place i have a record of the game i can have a record of the game without influence in the game i have a record of it a video form that is given to me after the game is over because it was recorded now imagine if i'm if i'm not limited by time i might be able to have access to that record even before the game took place but it's exactly what happened in the game so it's not what i'm forcing the game to be it's what happened in the game but i have access to it before because i am not limited by time or space that's just one of the ways and of course there are many logical um rebuttals and conversations back and forth but it's just a helpful little step to get us to think about how allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may be able to access time and access knowledge with without it necessarily happening yet from our point of view but it's already happened for him because for him Kun faya kun. So Allah Allama bil qalam, it is He Allah who allows for teaching to happen or for, for knowledge to happen or to be spread by the pen, meaning the divine pen, meaning the will that has already been set in stone from way past, because it is an account of everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willed to happen and everything that did happen. That did happen. Now qadr is a big discussion. You might want to uh you know read up read upon it on your own and inshallah we'll come back to it when we look at the ayat that speak about the qadr and speak about the lawh al mahfuz in general excellent so alladhi allama bil qalami allama al insana ma lam ya'lam this is the fifth ayah and it's here that the prophet muhammad sallam uh received the very first five ayat the very first five ayat of surah al alaq were the first to be revealed everything else came after the ending of the surah 
came after. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah al insana ma lam yalam. It is he who created the human being, and it's he who taught through the pen, and it is he who taught the human being what the human being knew not. There's a lot of things that we don't know. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who taught Adam the names of things, how to name things, language, right? And you've given, you've received from knowledge very, very little. When Allah speaks to Rasulullah, He says, It is He, Allah, who taught you what He didn't know, O Muhammad, and the knowledge that Allah has given you was a big favor from Allah, and the favors of Allah upon you, O Muhammad, are many. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barak ala Muhammad. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says, وَفَوْقَ كُلِّ ذِي عِلْمٍ عَلِيمٍ And above every person who knows, is someone who truly knows. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also tells us in another surah in the Quran, Allah brought you out of the wombs of your mothers. You knew nothing at that time, but he gave you the hearing, the sight, and the heart so that you're able to learn and through that knowledge, you're able to give thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there's an idea that the more we learn, the more we understand, the more we interact with reality, the more that we allow our curiosity to guide us to look for truth and to look for meaning and symbols and to construct and to interact with our reality, we will come to be more grateful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in Islam, it's not like the more that I know, the more that I'm distant from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The more that I know, the more that I grow in closer and connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tamam? Now, of course, that, that's going to depend on what I choose as the rules of my engagement with the world. If I choose to have a limited perspective from which I look at the world and to limit my, my, my knowledge uh, quest to things that I can only see or things that I can only recognize empirically, that's by definition a, a limitation that I've placed upon myself. So to, to be able to deconstruct any of those limitations and to interact the world genuinely, with the world genuinely, without any bias, it's going to be a difficult process, but it's one that liberates us. It's one that liberates us. Tamam? Tayyip. Quickly before we go, I'm just going to look at some of the comments here. Uh, can what's written be changed by dua? Yes. It. So here's the thing. Sister Warda asks a good question. Um a good question, and that is, can the qadr be changed by dua? We know the hadith, la yarudu al-qadha illa dua. So, the qadha, the qadha is the predestined thing that Allah has written. But the lawh al-mahfuz, the ultimate qadr, is the record of everything that has happened. So there's yearly qadr, there's weekly qadr, there's monthly qadr. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for example, reminds us in surah, uh, uh, in, in one of the surah, uh, one of the hawameen, he says, uh, on this night, كل أمر حكيم. There's a night, some say it's Laylat al Qadr. On this day, whatever is meant to happen for you for the next year will be written. And some of that will be able will be reversed through dua. That's why we make dua on Laylat al Qadr. Oh Allah, protect me from this and protect me from that. So the Qadr, what Allah has written for you specifically, might be changed through dua. But the ultimate Qadr, which we discussed earlier in the Lawh al Mahfuz, is a record of what ultimately happened and happens to you. So it takes into account the fact that you made dua for this qadr to be lessened or for this qadr to be removed. And then that is now a part of the new qadr that is given to you. But the ultimate account of what happens, the ultimate account of what happens is mentioned in the Lawh al-Mahfuz. Because the Lawh al-Mahfuz account includes all those changes that have taken place through dua. Because as I mentioned, it is a record of everything that you did and everything that has happened to you eventually, ultimately, taking into account all those little changes. And so that's why I said the discussion of the discussion of Qadr is a, is, a, is a big one, but at least this gives you, inshallah, some tips. And for, for anyone who wants to read more, explore more. But hopefully these at least give you the titles through which you're able to engage the discussion. Also, writing helps us organize thoughts. Absolutely. Hasib, may Allah bless you and give you the best in dunya and akhirah. Farooq Ghani, may Allah bless you and give you Jannah Firdaus, Ya Rabb Ameen. Uh, 20 minutes on words, subhanallah, how amazing is the Qur'an? That is true, yes, that is true. And we're going to be, inshallah, enjoying uh, Jazakumullah khair for the big size of the ASL. Alhamdulillah, I'm happy to hear that you're enjoying. Even after birth, the child is mu'taliq uh, to the mother, hooked around her arms. That is true, that is true. Excellent, excellent. May Allah bless you and give you Jannah al-Firdaus. Perfect. The zygote looks like a leech cloth but clearly not only um not clearly only books like one not literally 
sorry, the zygote looks like a, a leech like cloth, but clearly only in only books like one. Not literally. Sorry, uh, Nassim, I'm not able to understand, but I'm sure it's a it's a great uh, it's a great message. Zakumullah khair. May Allah bless you all and give you Janat for the Barakallah fiku. May Allah bless you, Sister Basent. I hope inshallah that it's beneficial. Tayyib. The record may change, and the recording of these changes of the record is also recorded. Read that a few times. However, the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is unchanged. Saif, jazakallah khair. Hopefully, be able to go back and inshallah read. I don't want to go into the details too much. We'll have a whole journey together, inshallah, in which we're able to discuss uh, the, the, the surah together. Right. So, this was the first section. This was the first section. Hopefully, in the last 20 minutes, I'm able to give justice to the end of the surah. And inshallah, whatever we don't finish off, I will do a separate video, a third video, inshallah, uh, recapping. Uh, and then, hopefully, inshallah, that will be before next Saturday. So, at least we have the surah as a whole. So, whatever I don't finish today, inshallah, or tonight, I'll do in a separate video um, that's continuing as a part of the series, inshallah. Tayyip. So the first few ayat, five ayat, were received by the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, in the Ghar of Hira. When were these ayat revealed? In Ramadan. When in Ramadan? In Laylatul Qadr. How do we know? Because the surah right after says, Inna anzalnahu fi Laylatul Qadr. وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا لَيْلَةُ الْقَدْرِ لَيْلَةُ الْقَدْرِ خَيْرٌ مِنْ أَلْفِ شَرْ So we know Laylatul Qadr is the time through which the Quran or during which the Quran was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Some say it's revealed from the Ruh al mahfuz to the to the first heaven and then from there to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, or to Jibreel and then from from uh, for, from uh, from uh, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to us. So we find out about it also uh, inshallah yani in Ramadan we connect with the Quran as well. طيب. So this is these are the first five ayat. First five ayat. Excellent. Now, kalla inna al-insana layatga al-ra'ahu so let's look at the second part of the surah. The second part of the surah highlights an example of somebody who, by thinking of themselves as self-sufficient, deviated away from the Quran, deviated away from the message. Right? Before I get into that, sometimes it is a big move now among young people to be financially independent. Oh, I want to be financially independent. I want to be in control of my hours. I want to be in control of my time. I want to be in control of my energy. I don't want to have a boss. I don't want to, all these things. And yes, sometimes those who think that way are genuine and they really want the control over their own time to be able to give back and to be able to help and to be able to not be stuck in a nine to five and be limited by a trivial or a nominal uh, kind of work that they're doing, which, you know, some people, alhamdulillah, they have the capacity and they're limited financially. So they want to be able to give back. But many people, they have this self-grandized image. I don't want to be doing this uh, little work. I want to be doing something great. So sometimes it's out of arrogance. And sometimes people want that because they just don't want anyone to tell them what to do. They don't want anyone to tell them what to do. Tamam? So here's an example of that. The human being indeed has the nature to transgress when he or see when he or she sees himself or herself as self-sufficient. Sulaiman, please join the WhatsApp group. I will let you know, inshallah ta'ala, when the video will be released, inshallah, طيب, or when the video will happen. So let's look, for example, at what Muqatil says. Muqatil has one of the early one of the earliest commentaries on the Quran that we still have. Many people have issues with Muqatil. And one of the reasons why they, people have issues with Muqatil is Muqatil tends to be very biased in his opinions towards, um, towards a specific uh, orientation. We can get to that later. But more importantly, he tends to report narrations that are very bizarre. All the other narrations that people have through books of hadith, they're, you know, they're, they don't have that much detail. Muqatil stands alone in having a lot of details in the narrations which he reports. And that's why some people are like, really? He's writing 120 years or 25 years after the Prophet Muhammad Sallam migrated from Mecca to Medina. So how, where is he getting all this information? Maybe what he was doing is he was collecting information, seeing other other muhaddithin and people are focusing on, you know, general pictures like, you know, I'm going to focus on the details. Or maybe he's adding in imagining some of these details later, imagining some of these de these details later on, to, on and adding them into the, adding them onto the, to the works. Or maybe he is combining between finding sources that no one else has access to and then combining. But nonetheless, in sharing these detailed uh, narrations, we can at least get a sense of how Muslims early on, 125, were imagining these ayat to have taken place. So in, in 
citing Muqatili, uh, you know, I could be citing Qurtubi, I could be citing Ibn Kathir, I could be citing much more classical, recognized, respected Mufassirin. But in citing Muqatil, I'm doing this, you know, specifically. Why? Because Muqatil is a standalone and giving us a lot of details, whether they're imagined or true. At least we get a sense of how Muslims were imagining this took place. So how is Abu Jahl interacting with Rasulullah now there's a big gap between the first five ayat. Rasulullah goes to his wife, cover me. After that, Rasulullah is, is, is given some time in which he's reflecting, goes to Waraqa. Waraqa tells him, you're a prophet. He doesn't know what to do with the information. He's you know really, really stressed out, looking for Jibreel, cannot find Jibreel. And then after a while, 40 days or so, there's no revelation coming. Now he's wondering what's going on. A while passes by, and then the ending of the surah comes. Some people say two years passed by. Some people say six months passed by. So technically, if we're going to go chronologically, we would wait a little bit and come back to the end of the surah. But nonetheless, we're going to just finish the surah. So at least we have a st the package surah and, and think and reflect upon that. And then inshallah, hopefully we can get a better sense of exactly where this end of the surah falls. But some people say between six months to, a, a, to two years after the Prophet Muhammad receives the revelation, this part comes. Others suggest it could be earlier. It could be a few months or so after Rasulullah received the first Five ayat. But nonetheless, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us The human being transgresses when he or she sees himself as as what? As self-sufficient. So let's look at the narration that, Muqal, uh, that Muqatil says. Muqatil says here, Abu Jahl, Ibn Hisham is what's being referenced. يعني بطر في ثيابه وفي مراكبه وفي طعامه وشرابه فذلك طغيانه إذا رأى نفسه استغنى وكان موسرا طغيا right? So what does this mean? The ayah refers to Abu Jahl When he made a fortune he would be extravagant in his clothing and in his rides and his food and drinks and he would transgress he would think of himself as self-sufficient sufficient because of his affluence needing no one else so here's the reference from Muqatil saying that this is referring to Abu Jahl, who would be very, very arrogant when he would make money, when he would have some money. Now, he gives us an example of when the Prophet Muhammad entered the Kaaba and he found Abu Jahl placing a gold amulet on the god that he worships, adding musk and saying, Oh, Hubal, thank you for everything. For everything, there's a comforter, and for you is the greatest reward. I swear to you, I will make you the happiest. I will make you happy. And this, he said, because the female camels that he owned delivered 1,000 baby camels for him, calves for him that year. Also, a caravan came from the Levant, the Sham, profiting him with 10,000 mithqals. If every mithqal is 4.25 grams of gold. So it's millions of dollars in modern sense that he made. So the caravan made him 10,000 mithqals of gold. So he dedicated, a, he dedicated his gratitude to Hubal, an idol standing 18 meters, or sorry, 18 arms length tall, situated inside the Kaaba. So these are details. Who's giving us these details? Muqatil. When is he writing? 125 years after the Hijrah. So it's still important information. Is it fully true? Allahu A'lam. But is it interesting to think about and to reflect? Yes, it's interesting to think about. So we know here, for example, that Hubal is the god that Abu Jahl used to worship, and Hubal was situated inside the Kaaba. The Prophet Muhammad said, What a shame. Your Lord provides for you, O Abu Jahl, but you thank other than him, by Allah, he has not withheld anything from you. How long will you continue this for? What a shame. Waihaka, Ammi, my uncle. I invite you to Allah alone, for He is your Lord and He's the Lord of your forefathers. He has created you and He alone sustains you. If you follow me, you shall attain the provisions of this Lord and the next. Abu Jahl responded by Allah and Al Uzza, swearing by the gods that He worships. Right? So if you look at the Arabic here and I've attached it, Wallata wal Uzza, wa Rabba Hadihi al Binya, al Bunya, la in lam tentahi an muqa an maqa letika hadihi, fa in wajetta kahuna, wa anta tabu du gaira ali hetina, la asfa anneka an ala nasiatika, ay la ukri jenneka, ala wajika, alaysa ha ulei banatihi, kal, wa enna yakun lahu walad. So imagine here what's happening, and I have attached for you the notes here. Abu Jahl responds, By Allah and Al Uzza and by the Lord of the structure, meaning the Kaaba, if you don't stop what you're saying, and you don't and if I ever come and find you here again, worshipping other than these deities, I will drag you by the forelock. Do you not see that these deities, Allah and Al Uzza, are the daughters of Allah? And the Prophet Muhammad's response is, 
how could you ever say anything and attribute anything like that to Allah? So whether this took place or not, what we know is there was confrontation between Abu Jahl and Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that confrontation led to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saying, my uncle, worship Allah and Allah alone. And Abu Jahl said, no, what are you saying? Get out of here, get out of my face. And he said, if you don't stop, I will drag you by the forehead and I will throw you onto the ground. And we know, for example, later on, he would throw disgusting things on the Prophet Muhammad Sallam's back when he would see the Prophet Muhammad Sallam worshiping and, 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 uh, and, and uh, reading Quran around the Kaaba. So why is this important? Because often we, we get the idea that there was a private time in which the Prophet Muhammad Sallam did not publicize the da'wah, did not publicize the da'wah. But however, even during this private time, he would still reach out to his uncles, reach out to his family, reach out to everyone individually and call them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala based on what he knows. But this will happen one, this will happen after the revelation of Surah Al-Muddathir, which makes it clear to him that now you have to inform. Qum fa'anvir. Get up and warn, get up and teach. So now with Surah Al-Ala, the first five ayat, he still doesn't know that he's a prophet, he's a messenger, right? And a prophet may be given knowledge by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but is not instructed to get up and teach, whereas a messenger is instructed to get up and teach. Now, of course, there are various other ways of defining prophet and messenger. Some said the two terms are interchangeable, but the, ter the, the uh, opinion that I do follow is the prophet is given knowledge, but doesn't have to teach it, just revives it, or is given uh, a new message. Like, um, for example, uh, Lut alayhi salam. We don't know that he's given a message, so we say he's a prophet. For example, Ya'qub alayhi salam, he's a prophet. Was he given a message specifically to teach? No, he's reviving a message that already exists, or he's teaching a bunch of ethics and, and, and good things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has instructed him to teach, but not a specific message, a specific book, a specific text that comes to bind an entire community. So a messenger is given a message, a specific message with a mandate to teach that message. That's the difference in a prophet and a messenger for your own information. So some ulama say that Rasulullah was a prophet for those few days that he received after he received the five ayat of Surah Al-Alaq. After 40 days or so, when he receives the remainder of Surah al or the beginning of Surah Al-Muddathir, that's when he comes to realize that he's a messenger. Because Allah says, Ya ayyuhal al-Muddathir, qum and when we talk about that, we'll uh, get a better sense of what's happening. So, kalla inna al-insana la yatgha, an ra'ahu staghna. So the person, the human being, uh, does this tughyan and the word tagha if you look at the Quran inna lamma tagha al -ma, you know uh, Allah used the word tagha to refer to the water that rises above uh, its 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 container so imagine there's water in this container or tea in this container and if it starts pouring and boiling and starts pouring out of the container that's tughyan tughyan so it floods out so the human being likes to do what likes to flood out of the boundaries that he should be in the boundaries like you know know your place you know when you say know your place don't don't like don't get out of your place stay in your lane you know when you say someone stay in your lane so when does a person stay? It starts going out of the lane and starts saying things that they don't know and starts you know kind of just too much when do they start doing that Allah subhanahu wa says many times when they see themselves as self-sufficient I don't need nobody I got money I got power so the ulama usually talk about Many forms of tughyan. They say tughyan of the beauty. When he sees himself as so beautiful, I don't have to do anything. I can get away with anything just by being beautiful. I can do the worst kind of thing and then I won't get in trouble for it. Why? Because I'm so beautiful. That's one form of tughyan, right? Where you start, you know, you start using your beauty to oppress others. You're using your beauty as a form of, um, as a form of power, right? You use use your, your, your beauty as a form of dominating other people. And we live in a society that is very materialistic and sometimes focuses on finding weaknesses in others by demonstrating constant beautiful displays that captivate and attract attention uh, and of course it's the it's the it's a duty on both sides for those who use that to be ethical in the sense of like is this really ethical is this really moral to play on people's weaknesses and also the person who's consuming that content to be ethical and to be honest and saying allah subhanahu wa has asked me to lower my gaze and to be conscious of what i internalize so it's on both sides the person who's displaying has to be honest in saying is this really good in terms of displaying and the person consuming has to ask is this good in consuming so that's one form of tughyan, tughyan of beauty another form of tughyan is the tughyan of knowledge those who say i have a lot of knowledge i have a lot of skill and i can use my knowledge to blackmail i can use my knowledge as leverage to haggle people or oh, you want to know well pay me you know those people who abuse others for the sake of giving them knowledge and sometimes that knowledge may even be made up Ooh, give me $100,000 and I will tell you where the uh, treasure that your ancestors hid or I will get you information about, you know, the person that you're, that is uh, 
uh, doing black magic on you and all that kind of stuff. The man. Other is a form of wealth. Like you see, people who are very wealthy politically, um, positioned and 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 privileged. They will begin to have tuyan in enforcing their own doctrines and enforcing their own views upon others. And also tuyan can happen because of people around you constantly giving you good positive compliments. And that's why we have to be very careful with our compliments. And I say this to everybody. If you see someone that is doing good and that is that is doing khair, know that that is a gift Allah has given to them. Maybe because of a secret between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Maybe because they suffered earlier on in their lives. Maybe because of a test. You don't know. So don't contribute to that person's test by constantly giving them compliments unconditionally, just like that. Because that will weaken their connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have to be very careful with the words that you give. Say them in the form of dua. Allah is using you. And I ask Allah to continue to protect you and to continue to use you. Allah has privileged you. Allah has blessed you. It's a responsibility. Hold on tight. So I'm giving them a compliment, but in giving them the compliment, I'm also keeping them grounded. So they don't now, oh, I'm so good. Yeah. You know, sometimes uh, you will see, for example, some people, they're still not, they still haven't developed a full a full sense of self-accountability. So for example, after they receive really, really good feedback from their supervisor at work, what happens? They start slacking off. Oh, I paid my dues. Woohoo, time to, uh, you know, not time not time to not do what is right. But shouldn't be that way. So it's the person's responsibility who's receiving the compliment to appreciate. You know, people are trying their best to appreciate. I appreciate it, but not let it get to you. You're never going to be as good as your fans claim you to be, and you're never going to be as bad as your critics like you to be or paint you to be. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows you better than you know yourself. So keep going, do the khair, avoid all the noise, whether good or negative. Use the criticism that comes from people who really, really care for you as an opportunity to grow. Yeah, exactly. This is good. Almost all of the time, they're not real and uh, they're exaggerated. Yeah, that, that is true. I like to always give people husn al when they, you know, when they give compliments, alhamdulillah, you, you have good intentions, but ignore and dismiss them, right? Ignore and dismiss them and, and keep keep in mind that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who uh, who knows you better than you know yourself, right? So, kalla inna l-insana la yatagha ar-ra'ahu istaghna ar-ra'ahu istaghna. Excellent. And I give given you here uh, a few examples of um, of uh, you know the forms of istighna that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala mentions in the Quran that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala mentions in the Quran and mentions in the in the Hadith. طيب. The Prophet Muhammad Sallam used to make this beautiful dua: Allahumma rahmataka arju, fala takilni ila nafsi tarfata ain, wa aslih li shani kullah la ilaha illa ant. Oh Allah, I seek your mercy. So leave me not on my own, even for the glimpse of an eye, and rectify all my affairs, for there's no deity besides you. This is a dua that we make to protect ourselves from our own nafs. Because sometimes we like to think of ourselves as self-sufficient. So one of the duas that we make to protect ourselves from that is this dua. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and give you Jannah al-Firdaus. Ya Rabb, Ameen, 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 Ameen. Tayyip. Inna ila rabbika ruja'a. Indeed, to your Lord is the final return. To your Lord is the final return. So don't think of yourself as self-sufficient because you always depend on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you always need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're going. You're on the journey back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how could you think of yourself as self-sufficient, as independent, as independent? We are social beings by definition. And, you know, we, we're always going to still need people. Like, for example, even if you're the greatest person in the world, how will you come to realize that you're the greatest person in the world without having people that tell you that? If you're the most generous person in the world, how will you be generous if there are no poor people to give money to? If you're the kindest person alive, how are we going to know what kindness is, is if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not create a system in which there is kindness and there's also evil in the world as a result of people's own decisions? So you're always limited and attached and bound by a system. The greatest politician needs people to govern. The greatest scientist needs what? It's part of an entire enterprise. So you're always limited and bound. Even physically, how can I think without my brain? But where does my brain come from? It's a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How can I articulate without my tongue? Where's the, where's the tongue from? So at the end of the day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us, everything goes back to Allah. Inna to Allah is the ultimate return. If you look at your phone and you trace all the resources or trace everything, where does it come from ultimately? It comes from Allah. Where is it ultimately going? To Allah. So everything comes from Allah and going back to Allah. So what? Take it easy. Recognize your place. Humble yourself. 
Sometimes we forget. It's such a simple thing. A child, you could have a conversation with a child like, yeah, I know everything comes from Allah. I don't know I'm going back to Allah. It's such a simple concept. But sometimes in our day-to-day -day interactions, we forget. But it is 6 o'clock, and we want, inshallah, respect everybody's time. So what I will do, inshallah, at this time is I will ask you, may Allah bless you and give you Jannah Fidels for your permission to bring the halaqa to a close. And then, inshallah ta'ala, I will be releasing a third video soon that finishes the surah, recaps everything, inshallah ta'ala, gives you a little bit more information about the other Mufassirun said about the end of the surah, contextualize a little bit, and then inshallah ta'ala, talk about some fiqhi perspectives on the salah, because the, the, what's mentioned at the end of the surah is a form of salah, sajda. So what kind of salah did the, the companions pray? How did the salah change across the time of the companions? What does Muqatir say? What does Ibn Abbas say? What does Mujahid say? What do these Mufassirun say? And how do we contextualize all of that within the bigger picture of the seerah. Jazakumullah khairan. May Allah bless you. Ask Allah to bless you, your families, and give you jannat for those. Keep us in your dua. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Nashiru la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka natubu alayk. May Allah bless you all and give you jannat for those. Jazakumullah khair. Um, sister Mushira. May Allah bless you. Uh, brother or sister Noor. Jazakumullah khair. Amir. Sister Rana Hamdi. Thank you so much for uh, translating for us. Uh, may Allah bless you and give you jannat for those or interpreting for us. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.